how much of hunting is about this experience versus the actual kill. I just been out here. It's more about the experience. Um, if it wasn't, we wouldn't come up here into these mountains. We could easily do this down around agriculture fields and probably kill real nice box and get all the food. And, you know, this is about everything. It's the food, it's the experience, the challenge of it, and all this that we get to see every day. Yeah, it's amazing. So in today's show, we're going to talk about eating in the backcountry, sleeping in the backcountry, and some things that I learned and uh, from a nutritional standpoint, time-restricted feeding standpoint, all that, um, being in the backcountry with Ryan Lampers, Brian Call, and James Sylvester in Idaho. We went for a mule deer hunt, and Deanna prepared some amazing recipes. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, Deanna, and for everyone listening or watching on YouTube, um, a lot of people, when they go backcountry, they bring in like a lot of dehydrated soups and uh if you ever step into an rei or a backcountry store or something like that right there's there's all these it was funny brian had this pad thai he had every night so basically what you do is you take your jet boil water mm -hmm. okay from melting snow because you're trekking up like 10 12 miles right and so he had this pad thai that was this dehydrated i don't even know what was in it right um, but he really enjoyed it, evidently. And but it gave him some bad gas, right? <laughs> so it's kind of funny because um, so let's talk about um, first of all, eating, like why it makes sense to be keto back there. Right. And so you and I have I mean, you're doing one meal a day. Mm -hmm. You've been doing, you know, compressed feeding pattern for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people what they don't realize is that when you're doing endurance exercise, it's very uh, aerobic. Yeah. Right? So it relies upon fatty acid oxidation. Um, and so it makes sense, right, to be keto or low carb, especially yeah. in that situation, mm -hmm. right? So you find like you do your morning routine, like you're running or you're walking or you're doing whatever. Um, again, very aerobic. So that's like a good context for being keto. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, well, it's changed my life, not just for how I feel energetically, but for the brain, just more productivity. So I thought it would be, you know, it just made sense to create those types of foods for you, knowing what you were going to endure. Uh, with all the hiking that you were doing and the strenuous, you know, just everything all about it. Just if we're to pack out an animal, animal or, yeah. so that's the thing to keep in mind, you know, the, the, the upside to being low carb or keto or fasting mm -hmm. and becoming more fat adapted is if you do more aerobic based work, whether it's walking, prolonged walking, prolonged running, like a lot of people are training for, you know, sp right now they're, they're putting in their base training for like spring Ironmans or marathons or 10 Ks or whatever, mm -hmm. very aerobic, very, it lends itself to a ketogenic style type mm -hmm. diet. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas carb cycling lends itself to more, you know, CrossFit explosive type movements, explosive type work, um, where there's shorter rest periods, like in CrossFit, it's like as many reps as possible and mm -hmm. ramps or, you know, EMOMs on every, on the minute, you know, kind of thing. So, so you're, you know, doing a lot of work in a short period of time. Right. That definitely favors more carbohydrate oxidation and things like that. So that's mm -hmm. where maybe carb cycling comes in in that context. Right. Anyway, so long story short, um, Deanna made these amazing recipes for me out there. And I guess there's pros and cons to it because they were heavy. Remember the fat bombs? The fat bombs? bombs were heavy. The raw breads weren't, right? Were they heavy? They were heavy-ish. Oh, really? But, but let's... Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> but it's fine. So my pack definitely weighed north of like 60 pounds and everyone else's pack. And keep in mind, so we were in the middle of Idaho, mm -hmm. kind of in the northern part. I can't tell you exactly where we are. It's kind of like a hunter's code. You know, you don't tell people exactly where you went, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we went mule deer hunting, again, with Ryan Lampers, who you know, and you know Hillary, mm -hmm. his wife. Great people. They have a great podcast, Hunt Harvest Health. Um Ryan is amazing, Deanna. You should see him out there. I mean, he just, he can spot mule deer and animals like nobody's business. I mean, mm -hmm. he is just, he's incredible. And um, so he likes to, when he's out there hunting, and by, this is a guy, by the way, I told you, um, he's, he, growing up as a kid, they never bought meat from the grocery store. Wow. But they ate meat. They ate whatever they caught, fishing mm -hmm. or hunting. Like that's how his family rolls. I mean, isn't that crazy to think about? It's amazing to think about, actually. It's amazing. Yeah. So, what an amazing I mean, lifestyle. 
you can kind of see like as a man, I kind of feel inadequate, right? Because in one sense, I mean, I, you know, there's all these new age ideas that we can maybe move away from animal flesh and in, fa- in favor like veganism and right. Beyond Meat, the Impossible Burger. Like there's certain CEOs of these companies that say, you know, if my kid is still, and I'm, this isn't me talking, but, you know, quoting them somewhat verbatimly, if my child, the CEO said, if my child still is eating meat in 50 years, like I failed. That's what the, the <laughs> CEOs are saying, right? Because wow. people are trying to say, like, you know, it's, it's meat's bad for the planet. Yeah. Obviously, an animal has to die, and that's problematic and all that. But anyway, getting back to this. So um, it feels like a very primal thing for um, men to do, right? Like yeah. to be able to go out in the forest, and this is what people did. Mm-hmm. This is how, I mean, we know through pigs. Are pigs easy to contain? Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> you had, uh, Deanna, you want to share the experience? With- just all I have to say is every time Mike leaves town, the animals find a way to escape. And uh, the pigs escaped. And I, uh, long, short of the long story is that I was chasing them around the neighborhood with our daughter and finally got them. And then they escaped again and trashed our yard. So there you go. Might came back so the just neighbors in time. were having like a Halloween party, and yeah. the two. And when we say pigs, these aren't like <laughs> mini pigs; they're, they're hogs. hogs. Like they're huge. The breed of, of pigs that we have is uh, Cooney Cooney and Juliana mix, and so they're not like the Berkshire hogs that are like three hundred pounds. They're probably nor- like they're probably 220, 230 pounds. Yeah, but they're like walking bricks because their their center of gravity is so low to the ground. Mm-hmm. I mean, good luck trying to catch one. Then they don't listen either. They know. Not, they, they just. People say pigs are smarter than dogs, but I highly suspect uh, that. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe they are, but they're very stubborn. They're a lot more stubborn than dogs. They're not there to please you by any means. They well, just want food. Yeah, and so anyway, the, the whole point is, and, and with birds, <laughs> birds like to fly away. I mean, we have turkeys and chickens, and like you have to really contain them. Yeah. And so the point that I'm trying to illustrate here is for humans to uh, eat protein, mm-hmm. it required a lot of containment and a lot of you know, steel and mesh and in cages and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I'm speculating because I wasn't alive 500 years ago, but I think it would probably be easier to go out and, and hunt an animal. Um, I can't remember when gunpowder was was in, invented in the first firearm, but, you know, spears and bows and arrows and things like that. And this is what Native Americans did and Native peoples. And mm-hmm. um, anyway, but I mean, it's crazy because when you go deer hunting, let me just ask you, the perception is like, do you think you're just kind of sitting there and then a deer just walks by and then you shoot it? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> well, you gotta run after them or I do some have strenuous to spot stuff. Them. So we were spotting them with binoculars. Like, so and this is totally new to me. I'm not trying to say I'm like this hunter guy. Like, right. I'm totally a rookie. Maybe next year, Mike. I wanna work on it. Yeah. yeah. But like, so it requires a lot of patience and mm-hmm. it requires a, like really being vigilant with binoculars and quote unquote glassing. So we spend a lot of the day glassing mm-hmm. really high elevation, like 8,500 feet, 8,600 feet. It was cold as heck. We we're sleeping out in the middle of nowhere. And again, just to bring this podcast, this conversation back so that if, if you're listening to this, you know where we're going. My sleep was so amazing. My dream recall stress. I felt no stress. Hmm. The only stress that I felt was like, oh, I can't believe I'm sitting here watching deer, like looking for deer. And I was like, I felt this inner guilt, like I should be working, I should be working on my book. I have like two books halfway completed. Like, And then I just realized like, I need to chill out, man. Like this is so cool. I, I get to wake up and look at deer's butts. Like not just deer's to, no, well, butts. So the mule deer have a white tail. Oh, you're serious. Wow. So you're looking for that in the landscape in Idaho. It's, you know, it's very dry, mm-hmm. a lot of sage bushes. So in the binoculars, you're looking on the hillside for that, their butt. Because mm-hmm. that's what's going to pop because their fur turns gray this time of year in the winter. So they're really hard to, to find. They would be out there. You couldn't see them with your naked eye. You need binoculars. Mm -hmm. And then so what we would do is see the doe, female deer. You'd see like four or five doe eating. And it was like, that was my job for the day. Like we would just, you know, the four of us would climb around and spot deer, see doe or see a buck. And then we'd move close to them and see what, how big the buck was. The buck is the male deer. Mm -hmm. And in the fall is the rut. And the rut is basically when the female deer, the does, go into estrus, and they're men's, they're they're um, you know ready for receiving semen from the buck, hmm. and they start to procreate. 
but as is in the dating world and for homo sapiens, for humans, you know, the does kind of lead the bucks on and they walk around and kind of play hard to get. And so mm -hmm. the bucks can tell when they're an estrus and what, what they're essentially doing is trying to procreate with one of the does. Wow. Yes. Yeah, and so that's why hunting, at least rifle hunting that we did is in the fall. Mm -hmm. because this is when this all happens, the so-called, the, the rut. Mm -hmm. Long story short, no stress, you know? Nice. Yeah, and so it's, it's just it was just amazing, you know? And I don't want to belabor this all being outside, uh, you know, and all that, but it's interesting to have a different baseline. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, like with your fat feeding and fasting pattern, like you have a baseline of comparison, right? right? Because you went from eating maybe two to three meals a day or sometimes snacking mm -hmm. to then shifting to one meal a day, and, that, and you really notice a lot of mental clarity. Oh, absolutely. More energy. 100%. Yeah. And um, it tested my resilience and um, it made me appreciate food, just like how you felt when you got back from your hunting trip. Like, really talk about that. I loved when you talk, you know, talked about the coffee thing and the yeah. food and how bacon smelled oh my so gosh. much different when you got back. But yeah, I, I mean, the appreciation for food just skyrocketed and my taste receptors changed. They did. Yeah. So anyway, the, the the point is to kind of unpack this trip is mm -hmm. you get a different baseline mm -hmm. to compare your like kind of normalcy, if you will. So you have some yeah. sort of equivalent, you know, so you're testing like, OK, this is how I feel out there. This is the stress that I feel. This is my sleep. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to get into next and all that. But anyway, it's just kind of interesting. It was like, you know, when I'm sitting there spotting deer looking for the butt. I don't know if I explain that, but mm -hmm. they're, they're white. They that's what sticks out. So you see this little white dot in the hillside. Mm -hmm. You're like, what's that? And then you start looking and you're like, oh my gosh, is it a doe or is it a buck? And you're, and you're kind of zooming in mm -hmm. and then you get super excited because it's kind of quiet. All you hear is the wind mm -hmm. and we're whispering the whole time because the deer can really hear voices, you know, and that scares them away. Right. And you want to get in close on them. And, mm -hmm. and so anyway, long story short, you know, we were unfortunately unsuccessful. We passed up a really nice big buck on day one. And the reason why we passed them up is because Ryan Lampers and Brian Call, they're professional hunters, essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, they're out, they were out there for 12 days, I was out there for eight. And they're like, look, you don't really wanna you know, tag out and get your deer on the first day. You know, you kinda wanna wait. And so, to, so you have the experience. And, and then we were thinking that, well, if we saw this big one on the first day, like we're gonna see even bigger ones once we hike 10 more miles way back in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, we didn't see any bigger ones. But the stress thing was a big deal, Deanna, and everyone listening. And um, you know, I wanna schedule for our family, like quarterly, quarterly nature, you know, just camping trips. Yeah. Like going out there, I think there's an underappreciated role um, and impact in human health that electromagnetic frequencies, EMF, mm -hmm. non-native EMF, cell phone towers, which unfortunately we have one pretty close to us. Like we can see it from our driveway. And, you know, I know a lot of people are like, well, what's the mechanisms there? How are these EMFs affecting human biology? Like what's going on? And I'll just tell you, I mean, my dream recall was crazy out really? there. Deep sleep through the roof. Wow. Woke up. I, like, yeah, I had one cup of coffee in the morning, mm -hmm. but I didn't really crave that additional cup of coffee. And I was kind of telling you the story, and I would like to kind of unpack it here. I think it's kind of interesting because in order to have coffee out there on the mountains, um, we, you, you have to melt snow. And, me, you know, we only have so much fuel that we're packing in. Right. You know, so right. melting snow yeah, as you drink your coffee, um, melting snow requires a lot of fuel, mm -hmm. which is totally fine. But if you're, if we have four people and we only each have one fuel container, you don't really want to run out of fuel because you want to be able to cook food and, and things like that and, and melt right. your water. So it was like, okay, do I really? So instead, like right now, after this podcast, I might have another coffee because there's no ramifications. There's no repercussions. Like we're not going to run out of water. Right. I mean, maybe we will, but it's very, very unlikely, low probability. Mm -hmm. Also... If I have a coffee here or anyone watching this that lives in like a municipal city, you know, there's really no major ramifications if you if you kind of get negative sleep because you can slog it out the next day. Right. You're not, you know, most people's occupations are not super high risk where if they, you know, move their finger one, one wrong direction or take a misstep, they're not going to die, Right. But we were climbing a lot at night, like moving around at night, sometimes multiple miles down these 
not necessarily cliffs. Like I don't want to like, you know, sensationalize the movement, but Mm -hmm. you know, a few missteps and you would definitely get a concussion or break a leg. Um, and we're carrying this pack. So I was like, you know, using my, I have a few props here for you guys listening in iTunes, um, on YouTube, I'll share with you, but you know, we had this, my headlamp, which we wear all the time around the house now. Mm Mm-hmm. This is a, is it Petzl? Yeah, Petzl's a brand. So it's just a, like a backpacking headlamp. It's so good for reading and all that. But that was our only form of light or source of light in the evening. And anyway, the whole point that I'm trying to say here is I wouldn't have coffee in the afternoon, even though I craved it. Because number one, I had to melt water, mm-hmm. which it required fuel. We have finite fuel. And, you know, the third point there is I knew that it would affect my sleep. Right. And I knew that we were under a lot of physical, there was a lot of physical demands, moving all of our equipment, packing our tent every day, hiking up the hills in the middle of nowhere at high elevation, close to 9,000 feet. But it's funny, we don't think about that in real life. Well, how grateful do you feel when you come back to your cozy home and your kettle that boils your water in two minutes? And you know, I was telling you, yeah. I mean, <laughs> what's the first thing I did when I got here? What did I do yesterday? I made a coffee. I was like, I really wanted a bulletproof. I got back. I drove back. It was like 11 or something. Right. And I hadn't had a warm bulletproof coffee. Yeah. I love a little ghee butter, a little little MCT. Like, I just, it's just kind of like, it's just a habit, right? And Mm -hmm. so it it felt so good Mm -hmm. to have that. And it just made me have a really different appreciation, you know, for, for everything. And so for parents tuning in, I mean, I think this is so good for kids, you know, oh, to absolutely. be exposed to this because, yeah. and I couldn't wait to share with Nez, like to, to get her out there in the back country and we froze our butts off. So one night it was single digits, howling wind, we were sleeping on the snow. Mm-hmm. And I, actually, I got another story. Let's check this out. So, um, all right. So when you're backpacking, right, you have a tent and you have a floor tent or a floorless tent. So we didn't, we had this Seek Outdoors, great company. I'll put links in the description below. They make these amazing tents that are super light for backpacking, and, but they don't have a ground. They're groundless tents. Mm-hmm. So you just have these stakes, and then the idea is you pack in, like, you know the Tyvek paper that we put, that I put on the siding of the house, um, mm-hmm. kind of a moisture vapor barrier? Yeah. So I had some of that Tyvek, but it was very narrow, and all it did was fit my sleeping pad. And in the binoculars, I saw a tarp. Like, <laughs> there were people that had been out there backpacking or something with... Um, with horses and so they they had just left a bunch of crap. It, was, it really actually irritated me and everyone else on the trip because we saw the, all this, all this big tarp out in, the, in our binoculars. And so as we were hiking this ridge, we went to check out what the tarp was. And I saw, and I was like, you know what guys, the tarp's in good condition, I'm gonna cut a piece of it. So I cut like a four by eight piece. That way in the tent, I could put my bag in there. I could lay all my stuff out and have a nice like little pad so my stuff wasn't in the dirt. Because mm-hmm. for like three nights, my stuff was in the dirt and it kind of felt like, crap, this is going to be a long trip, man. Mm-hmm. You know, all my crap's <laughs> in the dirt. Anyway, so you're just grateful for this stuff. like right. The little things, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. And, and look, I know people get gratitude from going to church and have spiritual revelations through doing different things, but being outdoors and like having limited resources. And, and let's talk about the food. And this is so interesting. So I have this hypothesis, Deanna. We can get into your raw veggie bread and exactly what you made for me because I really that's I really want to share that with people mm-hmm. because unfortunately a lot of the packaged stuff that you get you know like REI that we were kind of talking about the dehydrated soups and the things like that very carb heavy sugar right. heavy right and that creates this energy ebb and flow that is not really conducive to sustained hiking right right anyway so. Um, And most of it's processed too, which adds another layer on it. Probably not good for the microbiome. Not high in high quality fats. Um, Pretty much just calories, empty calories. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of it's carb based, and and, but again, I'm just speculating here, but I think the outdoors community is very carb based anyway. Just like endurance athletics. I mean, you go to like a running store. There's goos, there's gels, there's all that. Like it's very carb heavy. A lot of people are really talking about carbing up and fueling up and, and the, the fat adapted context is not there. Mm-hmm. Um, but can we talk about the sensations of food? Did I, I was kind of telling you this when I was driving yesterday and talking to you. Um, Deanna's heard all these stories, so you'll probably be bored. No, it's, it's a good it's reminder. Kind of <laughs> yeah, it's a good reminder. Makes me thankful for my second coffee today. 
Yeah, I'm gonna have one Sorry. afterwards. I'm, you're getting me excited about coffee. Oh, awesome. Um, <laughs> So yeah, let's let's kind of talk about that. I think it's interesting. So the sensations of food. So mm -hmm. I was vlogging up there. I'll, I'll cut to it later. Um, so Deanna makes this amazing raw veggie bread. Mm -hmm. And uh, let, let's just, do we want to talk about what's in it first or should I share the story? Let me just share, share the, story. the story. This is so yeah. fascinating. So, mm -hmm. so this raw veggie bread, you've been making it for years. I mean, we've had this for seven, eight years and, mm -hmm. and you have courses on that and mm -hmm. I'll put links below. Um, this bread is absolutely amazing. And it, essentially what it is, it's very high in fat, very low in carb, uh, moderate protein, but it's it's mostly um, vegetable derived fats and protein. So it's soda, soaked and sprouted nuts and seeds right. um, with some herbs. You put a lot of herbs in this particular one. And, and right. I, I've had this raw veggie bread maybe 500 times, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe more over the years. But when I was having it on the hillside and it was like eight degrees, howling wind, and I opened up my oysters because I, sorry, not oysters, uh, sardines. And then I had anchovies. And so I was, I would make a little sandwich because the sardines and anchovies that you packed for me were packed in olive oil. Okay. And so what I would do is I would fold up the raw veggie bread. I would put in like a sardine or an anchovy mm -hmm. and have a sandwich. And it was so, the flavors were off the charts. You're like salivating right now. Because it, I can't, I'm telling you. I so I need to, when we get done with this podcast, this is a video, I'm gonna do some more research or maybe another podcast about, here's my theory. Mm -hmm. And it's just a theory. This is not, I'm totally speculating, right? But I feel like in our industrialized modern world that is so convenient and all that, there's a lot of stimuli. There's lights, there's EMF, there's a lot of sounds. Like mm -hmm. the only sounds that I heard were, um, our footsteps are whispering, the wind, snow, rain, or um, occasionally we'd have a buck running up against a tree, mm -hmm. you know, rake, raking his antlers on the tree. Like th those were the only sounds. Oh, and birds, heard a lot of birds, right? Right. So th what I'm trying to say is the sensory inputs going into the brain, there were few of, fewer of them. You, do you see what I'm saying? Like, it's not like, like right now, if you're sitting on a, a subway or you're in a car, you hear the ambient noise of the car, you hear other cars, you hear horn, horns honking, mm -hmm. you're probably listening to this podcast while you're driving. Like there's a lot of stimulation going in. Right. And I, it's kind of like, you know, if you're at a bar or a party and people are talking, it's kind of hard to hear that person's voice unless you really tune in because the brain's kind of distracted, right? So imagine being in a quiet room where just one person is talking. You're going to hear all the subtle intuitions in their voice and you know, do they need to swallow or you might hear them swallow. You're going to hear way more. And so I have this neurobiological theory that when we're overstimulated and our senses are way overstimulated by so many different stimuli that it, we are, uh, you know, sensation of taste and, and olfaction and, and all that is diminished. It just kind of makes sense, right? Because there's only, maybe there's only so many, a finite input number of inputs in the brain. I don't know. I need to investigate the neurobiology. But I was talking to all the other guys, like, I'm like, does food taste better too out here? They're like, oh my gosh, yeah. Also eating in silence too. I mean, I've heard different people say that when you're eating in silence, when there's less stimuli, that they felt more nourished. So did you feel that way? Yeah. I, I didn't feel the need to snack or mm -hmm. to overeat. And I lost like about six pounds out there in a week, which I'm not worried about. I can gain it back. I'm not trying to be a bodybuilder. But it wasn't muscle, Mike. I don't think I... I mean, My face so was good. tight. Yeah. You know, I probably lost some fat in the face and whatever. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, the point of me talking about that is I wasn't having probably only having maybe 2,200 calories a day, mm -hmm. but we were doing a ton of work, probably burning 1,600. So right. I was definitely in a deficit, but it wasn't like I was starving or hungry. And that's the other aspect about being ketogenic in that state right. is because you know, everyone knows this by now, you know, ketones are inherently kind of satiating, mm -hmm. um, ketones quell appetite and ketones are anti-catabolic. Right. So there's some really good compelling research about that. Dom D'Agostino and Brendan Egan, um, other people, you know, Andrew Kutnick, you know, they wrote a review paper back in, I want to say it was March of last year in 20, March of 2019, um, talking, and it was a review about how ketones are anti-catabolic, but 
Yeah, the raw veggie bread was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I'll cut to uh, cut to some footage where Brian had a fat bomb. And <laughs> you and I have been low carb for a while. We used to make a lot of the fat bombs. Right. Why don't we do it anymore? I just don't think that they're uh, necessary. You know, uh, and in all honesty, um, it's not so much of a keto lifestyle that we live. It's more carnivorous with uh, vegetables in season and then the odd slice of pie when needed. So nothing strict. But um, I find we can get the fats just from naturally from fatty meats. And um, I just made those fat bombs honestly because of the situation and the convenience um, of having good calories. Yeah, of having like good calories. Good calories. It's not so much primal, especially like the coconut butter. I think that's the reason, main reason I kind of got the nut butters and the coconut butters out of the house was because, first of all, they were very tempting foods um, for both of us. We were just eating a lot of it unnecessarily. And so we got rid of them because the more you have in your house with that kind of variety, the more you're going to eat um, unnecessarily, right? So, um, but it just it just fit the the mission. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a, it was a great situation. So we've kind mm -hmm. of been like dogging on carbs and packaged food and yeah. stuff. But I think a fat bomb in that environment where you're doing a lot of activity, a lot of aerobic activity, yep. maybe it's cross country skiing, maybe it's hiking, maybe it's backcountry hiking. Um, that's a perfect context for a fat bomb. And I, I mean, would have packed like raw beef suet and stuff like that. But like that fat tends to turn very quickly. So it really needs to be cold. And so that's the reason I didn't pack that, which I would cold. prefer. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be that cold. I know. But Had like I the known. raw bone marrow, like I'm definitely more about those fats versus like the coconut fat bombs. Um, I just think that there's they're more micronutrient dense and better for the body, all the above. But um, I just wasn't sure how that would save over you know eight to ten days the raw the raw marrow the suet the ribeye fat that type of thing. So that's why I got the coconut. Yeah. yeah, which by the way, those fats you talk a lot about in your OMAD course, yeah. which I'll put links below. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I personally think like in, in daily living, a variety of animal fats and plant-based fats are healthy. Yeah. Um, when I say plant-based fats, the only the plant-based fats you really don't want are the canola, the cottonseed oil, the soybean oil, the sunflower right. seed oil. Those are very, you know, those industrial seed oils are susceptible to oxidation. So, so exclude those. You know, but the fruit oils, like the avocado oil, the olive oil, the coconut oil, and even better, the more whole food, like coconut butter. And so if we, we sometimes cook with coconut oil here at home, yeah. but we also have coconut butter. And so the butter tastes amazing. It does. And I thought it would taste better too than like, you know, ghee can, it's kind of hard to digest, even though it's clarified too. I mean, I could have packed you, if I had ghee. a little bit more time, some ghee too, which darn it, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Oops. But for the protein, um, not to skip around too much, we'll, we'll hold off on the protein. Mm -hmm. But the, anyway, the fat bombs were amazing. And so that's, that's what I would have for dinner. Mm -hmm. I, I just found that like a little bit lighter in the morning. Um, and I was doing the early time restricted feeding. So I would get up, make my coffee, and when I say get up, it's like you're shivering in your tent. And Brian Call, uh. Uh, I, I attended with Brian Call. He's a funny guy. He's mm. got a great podcast called The Gritty Bowman. Um, he's been hunting his whole life. Super awesome guy. He's 45, but it looks like he's like 36, you know. Um, he's. I told you, he's never, he's had like four cups of coffee in his entire life. Wow. He's never touched alcohol, smoked pot, never done any drugs. He's just a really cool guy. Mm -hmm. And so I learned a ton. Um it was neat. Like we had this routine, you know, like I would set up the wood stove. So these seek outdoor tents, you know, the, the, uh, groundless tents that I was telling you about, he would set up the tent. I would set up the stove. They have these small little stoves and then we'd break wood and, and then we'd tear it down in the same order. So we like had this routine and it was pretty cool. I mean, it, it was a little mundane, like here I go again, I'm freezing my butt off. It's dark out. I have my headlamp or putting together the stove. But it was like, that's how we do. And it, and then we would go to bed. And so I think the reason why I'm getting into these details is that, you know, a lot of people suffer from sleep issues where they they can't sleep. And they're like, I don't know what it is. I've tried CBD oil, I've tried this, it doesn't work. Like, I don't know what's going on. And I think it's healthy to have an evening routine yeah. that leads to predictable, you know, uh, increases in sleep and sleep pressure. Mm -hmm. And so this was our routine. And then it was like, once we get into the tent, 
you know, at night after the sun's down and it's dark. And, and then it's like, all right, well, we brush our teeth and we go to bed. We talk a little bit. Sometimes, you know, Brian would have some food. I did bring my Ned CBD. So I had CBD oil derived from hemp mm-hmm. every night before bed. So, you know, that I think really helped with the recovery because day one, we climbed a ton and my Achilles was hurting me, my right oh, Achilles. Oh, you didn't tell me that. Oh, man. And I was so nervous, like, man, oh. my, I don't know if I can carry on. So I took a ton of CBD. So I'm, I'm super excited for our show sponsor, mm-hmm. Ned, HelloNed.com. Definitely you can save on their biodynamically grown hemp-derived CBD oil. It's good stuff. From the hemp flowers. They use a cold ethanol extraction. So there's no solvents. And they're one of the few companies, actually, Deanna, and everyone listening or watching that is very transparent. So they show their C of A's, their certificate of analysis mm-hmm. for residual solvents and also pesticides and herbicides right on their website for every lot. So I like that transparency. I mean, and I that's, love their lotion too. It's like, that's my favorite. It's really, really The lotion good. that they have is like, I just love it. And so I didn't know if I was the only one, you know, using CBD, but Ryan Lampers, who was like the main hunter on the trip and the person that invited me, he's big into CBD too. And they actually have their own CBD company based in Bozeman. So, oh wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's really cool. But yeah. yeah, anyway, so the point is, you know, having routines, I really realized how important that is. Yeah. It's super important to have routines. And so we had this routine and gosh, you know, I would, I would just fall asleep, um, not wake up till six in the morning, just out, mm-hmm. you know, because, you know, again, like, if, if you binge watch Netflix or you're on your phone all night, you know, here in, in 21st century industrialized life and you can't really sleep, you, you can go move to the couch, you can move to another room, you can turn on the computer, like right. you can do stuff, but I'm sleeping with someone else. Like I don't want to wake him up. Yeah. There's nothing for me to do at three in the morning if I'm tossing and turning. Right. So I was like, I have to sleep because I'm going to be <laughs> bored out of my mind and I'm going to be tired. <laughs> And so this weaves in this early time restricted feeding that I wanted to get into. And, you know, you can speak to this as well because that's what you embark on. Mm -hmm. You know, our our meal timing impacts our circadian biology. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, all right, I really want to make sure I'm sleeping good. So I'm going to eat at least three to four hours or more before going to bed and have nothing else. I don't want any food in there to perturb, you know, uh, sleep. And so... Like I was saying, I'd have the breakfast with this either sardines uh, and the raw veggie bread or the other source of protein that I brought, thanks to Deanna, is dehydrated beef heart. Yeah. And that was, so what I would do to, the, again, to, because food tastes so good out there, what I would do is like, <laughs> and I had to ration it because this was my only protein. It was like three cans of canned fish with olive oil or this mm-hmm. big bag of beef heart because we you got a big grass-fed beef heart, which was for folks not watching on the video, it was probably the size of a football. Like it was massive. And they were really dried and kind of rock hard, but you you, you uh, oh, rehydrated them, eh? No, mm-hmm. they were chewy when I rehydrated them. So what I oh, did was I would oh, break oh. a small piece off and put it in my tongue right, and let it linger Ooh. and sit there and then rehydrate that way. It had the good salt in there too from real salt. Redmond I mean, real yeah, salt. Yeah, Redmond real salt. It tasted so yeah. good. I put lots of salt in those. Did That's you notice? Awesome. Yeah. yeah, and you marinated them. Marinated them. Yeah, so 24 hours. Let's get into the time restricted feeding thing. But first, I would love to kind of share with people how you dehydrated meat because I think that's really yeah. cool. So, oh, yeah, it was my first time too. So, it was just so easy. I don't know why I waited so long to do it. Uh, but I just sliced, I, we have a big old beef heart that we got from a local farmer and grass fed, grass finished, and sliced it real thin, <laughs> stuck them in a, um, a uh, silicone huge baggie with uh, some coconut aminos, like a half a cup if you want the recipe, here you go. Uh, Garlic coconut aminos, uh, just good salt, very little ingredients. I think that was it. And then it sat in there for 24 hours, uh, let them drip on a tray for five minutes, and then stuck them on the dehydrator tray uh, and dehydrated for, I think it was like maybe 10 hours on uh, 95 Fahrenheit to keep the food enzymes preserved. And it dries out the meat right? And that was it. So easy. But you know, um, if you, if you go ahead and do this at home, just, you can have it a little bit moister. Like I let it dehydrate just so that Mike wouldn't get sick for whatever reason. Cause it was my first time I was nervous. I wasn't sure, but you know, you eating they the, were a little the hard. they were a little tough, but if you dehydrate it for like six to seven hours and just keep looking at them, it's kind of moist. It, I'm sure it's amazing and delicious, but yeah, I'm glad it worked out for you. We got to do that more often for Nez or Heck yeah. Yeah. for other trips because it was, yeah. it was so convenient to just have that protein and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then just a small plug for the CoQ10 when you're out there. I mean, remember right. coenzyme Q10, a lot of people think it's an antioxidant, but it's, it's really involved in mitochondrial, the so-called you know, oxidative phosphorylation and mm-hmm. 
electron transport chain, which, you know, not to get into big, you know, complex biochemistry jargon, but it, that's really kind of how you aerobically are making energy in the form right. of ATP. Yeah. So it was nice to have, you know, the, the organ meats and the CoQ10, good protein, um, carnitine, all that. So, and right. taurine as well. Taurine is really concentrated in the heart. Taurine is an electrolyte. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that was really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was my protein source. So my dinner was usually, you know, the fat bomb and then the dehydrated beef heart. Mm -hmm. And I was compressing the feeding window. So I, I would, what I like to do, because first thing, like we would get up at six, we'd have our coffee. I would take my Benchmade knife and like scrape a little bit of the coconut, uh, off the fat off the fat bomb. Mm -hmm. Just mix it in the coffee just for flavor. Because I had this dehydrated organic coffee kind of tastes like crap. And that helped, you know, <laughs> make that a little bit more palatable. Right. We would, you know, unpack the tent, get ready. Um, by seven, it was still dark, and so we would start climbing up to the ridges where we would spot the animals. And so, it was, and so I would use that like forty-five minutes of climbing to kind of get warmed up and so forth. And mm -hmm. then, after spotting for about an hour, it'd be like about ten o'clock. That's when I would have my breakfast out there. Mm -hmm. um, I probably could have waited for longer, but I was. It was like true hunger. Like I could feel it. Like okay. I gotta eat. Like and you I need want... to feel that. That's important, right? True hunger is. Yeah, Holy it's great, cow! Man. It's like what is that, right? We have so much food everywhere. A lot of people don't experience true hunger, and that's one of the benefits of fasting. And I know, yeah. you know, people in the calories in, calories out community kind of poo poo fasting and say, "Oh, it's a bunch of crap." But you know, it really does help you experience true hunger and get to realize what that is. So I think that's kind right. of interesting. But, right. um, and then what well, I would basically when dinner when it was close to dinner, I wouldn't have lunch. I'd maybe. You know, you also packed some nuts for me. So there was like some Brazil nuts or some okay. walnuts and there were some, I think, almonds in there. And then maybe some, I want to say there was a few goji berries, wasn't much, some coconut flakes and then um, cacao nibs. So and coconut nibs. Yeah. And I activated the nuts just by soaking them in warm water with, with good salt, which makes them more bioavailable. So that was important. So I'd kind of snack yeah. on that around yeah. noon, I, you know, maybe noon or one, like if we were climbing hard, that's what I would snack on. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, and then I would look at the sun, and I could, I could, was pretty good after a few days of going. Okay, it's about four o'clock, you know, and you could see it getting close to the mountains, and that was my cue. It's like, okay, it's, this is time to eat dinner because the sun's going down, and again, I'm, I'm compressing food in this this format to help get my circadian rhythms good, and then to optimize sleep. And it was really like, again, it was more about functionality and being able to perform and recover. Why I was so interested in, in optimizing sleep, yeah. and I realized like. And then I, it's funny, you know, I was like, why am I so kind of safeguarding or emphasizing sleep out here? But back at home, I'm on my damn computer sometimes at 10 o'clock at night or I'm editing a video or I'm staring at my iPhone. I know better. Because like, you I, think you're being productive, but then you wake up and you wonder like why crap. you have the brain fog. And yeah, it's completely, yeah. So it, it was just, it was a really good eye opener. And I tell you, I promise you, Deanna. And for Do you Inez, promise me? I promise you. Going forward, <laughs> I'm having really hard boundaries around my tech yeah. and phone. And because that's the biggest thing to induce that sleep pressure, that darkness. Yeah. And, and even if you're wearing the blue light blocking glasses and we have a great relationship with blue blocks and we love these things. And by the way, I wore their sleep mask every night. That really helped because oh, good. Yeah. Because in the tent, there's no blockage. And so that really helped me stay asleep. Mm -hmm. They have this Remedy sleep mask that's amazing. I'll put it in the links below. Remedy, like our on rapid eye movement, REM Remedy sleep mask from Blue Blocks. Links are below. Use the promo code HIH, friends, if you do get that. Um, it was really cool because I could hear Brian at like five in the morning, like tossing and turning because he could start to... It's not getting light, but it's getting lighter because the mm -hmm. sun is rising. And that's enough to kind of tell your body to start releasing cortisol and, you know, you start to wake up. Anyway, so sleep. Um, I woke up today. Today was the first morning that I've been back in city life, basically, right? Because I slept in my truck going out there. Um, and let me just tell a small story. I know I'm all over the place, friends, but just bear with me. Uh, so when I was leaving Idaho, after getting out of the woods, um, the guys stayed in for another four days. I just, we're going on another trip and have stuff to do. So I couldn't stay out there for 12 days like they are, or they might stay even longer. It just depends. Mm -hmm. Again, they're professional hunters. Like the hunting season in the fall, it's like they dedicate a, t a lot of time to being outdoors. Right. Long story short, you know, I'm, I'm driving uh, through Coeur d'Alene, right, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, Northern Idaho and Spokane. And it's about eight o'clock and I really wanted some water, you know, because I, I, I ran out of water. 
and the water on the mountain was amazing. Melting snow, we're getting it from the river and then sterilizing it with a UV light called a SteriPen. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna just see if this gas station has like some water and glass bottles, you know, maybe like a Pellegrino or something. And it's very hard to find water and glass bottles nowadays. Mm-hmm. As I'm driving into the gas station, you know, I noticed these street lights and this is the first time I've seen light at night. Remember in eight days, eight full days, which that in the grand scheme of things, that's nothing. But that was enough, like these street lights and these, this was not in, you know, New York City. This is like in a smaller town, you know, in Idaho. The, the street lights are not that bright. They were hurting my eyes in the same way that your computer hurts your eyes when you're on a computer. So I was like, that to me was a major aha. Like, wow, we're becoming so desensitized to all this artificial light at night. We don't realize the impact that's, that's having on the body. And so I'm, I'm holding, for folks just listening to that audio, imagine like, you know, you're, it's really sunny out. You kind of put your hands over your eyes by your eyebrows. So I'm like in the parking lot, all this light in gas stations, gas stations is they have a ton of light. I think probably if like shoplifters need to see stuff or people feel comfortable, I don't know. Right. You know, I didn't even get out of the car. I just said, screw it. I'm not going to buy water. I don't even care. Like I don't need it that bad. Yeah. And, but I was out of water. I love to have water in the morning when I get up. And I was like, you know what? The risk to benefit ratio is not there. Like I don't want to mess up my sleep. That's been going really, really good. Right. I had no baggy eyes, great energy, everything. And I'm like, I just kept going. Mm-hmm. I just pulled out. I said, screw it. It's not worth it. Because I know when I go into that gas station, there's going to be a ton of fluorescent lights. Like, it's glowing. And you don't realize that. Like, you know, tonight, if we had to go to a gas station, I probably wouldn't think twice because I'm now reacclimated right. to all this bright light. And it's, I think it's a major, major problem. But friends. it's everywhere, even along our streets. You know, we have to wear our glasses when we go for a walk at night. In our neighborhood. In our neighborhood. And it, it just... To me, that's just, I mean, I get it. People are nervous. They don't like the dark. It makes them feel comfortable. But with what we know, uh, it's just, it's going to disrupt the sleep. So we have to go like in a certain a pathway yeah. where there's no lights. But see, they're building a lot in our neighborhood, which makes us extremely nervous to the point where we're like, maybe we have to move because we're not going to be able to leave our house at night because of all the lights that are out on the streets because these new developments are coming in and they're right. replacing the older amber lights mm-hmm. with these v- like neon oh, bl- white light. And like it's the gas so- station lights. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's just really obtrusive. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so no kidding, as a family, when we go on our walks, we wear blue light, black, and glasses. Even our daughter, who's seven years old, wears them. And so it's um, yeah. it's important. I mean... And think of all the kids, too. We were just talking about this, who are playing sports like soccer at night. Um, with all the fluorescent indoors and you know they have all those fluorescent lights and so if you have a kid who's having trouble sleeping uh, think about you know what you're doing you know before bedtime if they're especially because a lot of the soccer games are at night right so um, like they had one uh, we had our daughter in one that was at seven to eight and we just said you know what oh my gosh what are we thinking like we know so much about this and there's fluorescent lights indoors and she was restless at night last night, so we just cut her from it and put her in one like right after school at 4.30, even though it's not that good for our schedule, but it's just, it doesn't matter, you know? Yeah, it's, you noticed after soccer that she was tossing a turn. We both were. We both were, even though, you know, it's, yeah. So you just got to think about those little things that could potentially be causing your sleep disturbance, and especially with your kids. If they're not, like, thinking at school or they're acting up, um, maybe change up what you're doing before bedtime. Well, you bring up a really good point, and I think it's something that a lot of people don't recognize or realize. And had I not, you know, f- been following the circadian biology research for since 2012, really, um, so I have all these alerts when new studies are published because I've been like citing all these studies for years. Mm-hmm. And uh, back in it was August of 2018, and I can link the study below. Um, scientists um, showed that light exposure to children and in the hours before bed had a much more powerful suppressant effect on melatonin production compared to adults. Wow. Because the shape of their eyes is different. I can't remember if it's more oval shaped or circular. I can't remember all the details of the, you know, the histology of the eye, but suffice it to say that light exposure is much more of a problem for children than it is for adults in terms of melatonin suppression and adenosine metabolism. Wow. Yeah. And so... Yeah, I know a lot of parents, like, you know, working families, especially single parents and stuff, like, you know, they allow their kids to watch television before bed or, or right. they're on the iPads or the, the iPhones or, or, you know, various devices. It's really important that you, you minimize that for your child. And right. 
or mitigate that with affecting the, the temperature of the color of the screen using different, you know, f, f dot lux flux app, um, mm-hmm. things like that, or and or where the glasses or a combination of all of them. And we've also changed the lights in the home over the years to yeah. the uh, uh, Edison lamps. bulbs. On salt lamps too. Salt but lamps. Well. Man, you just got to think too, being that their brains are so sensitive and they're like sponges. I mean, I wonder if they're more you know, sensitive to things like the cell towers around us and like little things that affect us. Oh man. Probably. I mean, I think again, you know, just comparing my dream recall again, I don't want to make this all about me. I want to help people realize it. And again, I I keep a pretty good pulse on my health and well being and where things are at. And I woke up every morning, Deanna and everyone listening, just these vivid dreams where I could remember all the people, the context, the situations, like it was right. very, very vivid. You know, if you're asking our kids about dreams, like so parents out there, uh, maybe if, you're, if your kids don't really talk about their sleep or they don't know how to articulate it, maybe just ask them about their dreams and keep your own journal. If they say, you know, I don't remember my dream or I had a really scary dream last night, like we ask our daughter those things and that's when we know that she's had some, you know, at least REM. I don't know about yeah. the deep sleep, but... I think it's a good yeah. proxy. Um, yeah. You can look at their eyes too. And, and yeah. I'll be honest, our daughter does have some bags under her mm-hmm. eyes. And, and it makes me wonder because my I, I can get little bags and my bags under my eyes this morning were like, I noticed right away way bigger than they were when I was out there. Mm-hmm. It's like, is it mold? Is it environmental? Is it, I mean, what what is it? It's hard to pinpoint because there's so many different things. And we did have a later than normal dinner last night. We did. You know? Yeah. We didn't do a big walk. We did a walk like, the, you know, but I was on the phone. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's, it's really hard to pinpoint. Yeah. And again, I want to, I want to emphasize this even more for people because, you know, we have clients all the time, you know, that see us virtually or in our courses and they say like, I'm eating a perfect diet, but I'm still not losing the weight. I'm still, my blood sugar is still erratic. You know, they, they can't seemingly figure out what's going on. And mm-hmm. I can't help but wonder, I mean, is it all these other things that are, they're not doing? And it seems to me. So many factors, you guys. So many factors. Got a journal. Got a journal. Got, got, a got a journal. Track sleep. Got to track heart rate variability. Track um, my heart rate variability did improve. My deep sleep went through the roof. Yeah. Um, and my REM stayed the same. It didn't mm-hmm. go down or up. It just stayed the same. So, mm. um, Yeah. I mean, I guess to summarize the seemingly, there's a lot of different things we talked about, you know, but I just wanted to share this in iTunes and then also on YouTube, you know, um, to kind of summarize some of the things, light exposure is a big deal. Um, getting morning sunlight. So watching the sunrise, watching the sunset, it had a a huge impact on circadian biology. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, um, the food that Deanna made was phenomenal. Thank you for making that. I felt like I was eating like a king out there. What you didn't share is the other bread that you made. It was like a pumpkin acorn squash bread. I did. You know, we didn't even talk about the ingredients in the raw bread and what raw bread is for people who don't know what the heck we're talking about. Yeah. So um, back in the day, I was raw vegan. It wasn't a good lifestyle for me, but I learned a lot from it. Uh, and uh, I learned how to make these raw veggie breads, which saved me. And to this day, I think they're I still love to make them, um, but basically what we had done, what I had done was I activated uh, raw nuts, such as like walnuts and um, cashews. cashews and some almonds, and then I had some Brazil nuts and macadamia nuts in there too, just to have kind of a variety, and I would blend up uh, some of these nuts, maybe like half a cup, and then throw in some other ingredients, and I used actually a lot more herbs. Like I really wanted to focus on the most n- micronutrient-dense in-season vegetables, which it's getting colder here in the Pacific Northwest, so there wasn't like a ton of variety. Um, our gardens aren't really growing much of anything right now, so um, stuck with the herbs like cilantro and parsley, and then um, I did add some uh, carrots, which, you know, a little higher carb, or, but you know, whatever. I knew Mike was just like at the point where he just wanted something really super delicious and healthy. Um, and then, uh, so anyway, I had made these uh, flatbreads where basically are blending up everything in a food processor. It t- it's like as quick as a smoothie and um, there's no added sugars, no fruits, nothing. And then you spread it on these dehydrator trays, uh, which takes like a couple minutes. And then you put it in your dehydrator for like eight hours, which I just put, do it at night so that when we wake up, we smell this amazing you know, smell, which is the raw veggie bread. 
And um, I had made more of like a flatbread that wouldn't um, fall apart when he was hiking. So I had envisioned that you were probably going to have it all squished in there in the, in the backpack. Mm -hmm. So you can make these either like super flexible, like a wrap where you like can put meat and stuff in them. Or um, what I did was I just dehydrated them so they were like really firm. And then I cut them in squares and made them in like little sandwich things, knowing that you were going to take your sardines and anchovies and stuff and make little sandwiches. So anyway, they're they're delicious. And kids really love them. And you can actually, you can take like cookie cutters and make little shapes and so many varieties and that's what our course talks about and how to become your own artist with them so you can make them keto you can make them like really anything any lifestyle you know i mean again we're more i'm i'm definitely more like carnivorous lately but um i still love the raw veggie breads i just absolutely love them and they're so much easier to to digest mm. and most importantly they're dehydrated at 95 degrees so that they're considered raw. Food enzymes are preserved. So I much prefer eating raw veggie breads than salads. I just can't digest these huge bowls of salad as I get older. And I think many people struggle with that. Um, so they turn away from vegetables. But I think there's a lot of really good things about vegetables and seasons, like so many polyphenols and things that maybe you might be at least missing like i i'd miss veggies if i completely didn't eat them me too yeah, yeah. i mean we tried yeah. carnivore strict for a while and it was like it was yeah. but again we don't have autoimmunity we don't have yeah. depression yeah. we don't have a lot of these things that some people right. um, that are attracted or benefit from the carnivorous diet you yeah. know we don't we don't necessarily we're grateful we don't we don't have those yeah but yeah i mean i i think you know the, the raw veggie breads kind of enable the consumption of these foods that would otherwise be somewhat indigestible and caused gastrointestinal distress right. that enable them to be much more digestible, much more palatable. Mm -hmm. And it's so much easier than like juicing. I find there's a lot of waste with juicing unless you're using the pulp for something. But, you know, all I need is a tiny little square of raw veggie bread with like my big plate of meat and I'm good because that little square of of raw veggie bread is like having like a mini bowl of salad with good fats because there was olive oil in that too. So there's some good olive oils You're and there was the activated nuts and seeds and <laughs> and then some herbs and a few little carrots and boom, you know, and it's so. way better. You know, a lot of people go to the grocery store and they buy uh, gluten-free bread and yeah. it's sorghum flour or rice flour. Yeah. They, they, I mean, yeah, it's maybe lowish carb, lower carb than maybe some wheat stuff. It doesn't have anti-nutrients like gluten potentially, right. but it's like it's really devoid of nutrition, I feel like, and there's no fat in there, no good fat. And so the raw right. veggie breads are a nice hybrid. And again, we're not, you know, trying to necessarily promote these. I mean, we, we would welcome no, no, no. you if you, if you go, if you go to courses.highintensityhealth.com, that's where the courses are. You have, we have eBooks and then also a full on course that teaches people how to do it. Um, I just find like two, Mike, sorry to interrupt, but I get so excited about these. You know, I mentioned I put carrots in them, but um, I still consider us extremely like pretty much like low carb. I think um, when I say that, you know, we're keto, our bodies are burning fat for fuel um, because of the certain foods that we're eating, right? So like the veggies in season and the berries in season, et cetera, you know, all within like portion sizes, um, our bodies love them and they're happy and healthy and we have a great relationship with food, which keeps our bodies burning fat for fuel. So if you're going to the store and you're buying all these processed low carb things, which are like, you know, fine moderation, again, we're only human, we like them too once in a while, but, um, and, and you're noticing you're not, you know, you're either putting on weight or you're just not feeling good or you have brain fog, it could be like, you can't always look at the numbers on the food labels and, and especially if you're eating processed foods, because maybe your body is just like rejecting them and it's like empty calories for your body. So can't always think, okay, like I got to eat these low carb foods to be keto. Right. So it's just how your body metabolizes these things. So that's why I wasn't worried about putting a few carrots in your. Oh yeah. Because you know, I mean, one of the ways to get into ketosis, like you're talking about is a mm -hmm. low carb, high fat diet. Right. And the other two ways is exercise, physical exercise is right. naturally ketogenic. Mm -hmm. The third way is compressing your feeding window or fasting. So, yeah. the, and of course, the fourth Good. way is taking exogenous ketones. But, mm -hmm. you know, those are kind of the main ways. And right. so, if you're doing the exercise, you have a lot more buffer room in terms of the carbohydrate consumption that you can afford. Which I knew you would be doing when you were out there in the forest. And so, plus the cold temperature. So, constant cold oh thermogenesis, right? So Dude, shivering, the cold freezing. plunges save my butt out yeah. there, man. It was like training. Right. I'm so glad I did that. So um, <laughs> I have other videos and we've talked about brown fat with Ben Bickman and other people on the podcast. But um, yeah, the cold plunges was, were great. It was great training, you know, mm -hmm. because I was able to tolerate that. Had I not had that preparation, I might have quit. 
Yeah. yeah, I'm going to quit. And Ryan has brought people out there hunting that have quit before on day two. And he had to hike them out. And wow. I was like, I'm not quitting, man. I am not. Right. Even though this is like a really rugged country, treacherous environment, I kind of wasn't mentally prepared for that. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a really good, it, it makes life here in Kirkland, Washington seem like a damn walk in the park. It's like Disneyland. I woke up I like, <laughs> oh, it's like Disneyland. I can just be able to have coffee, warm coffee. I'm a bulletproof coffee, like I can get on the computer. Like it seemed like this is so easy and I just had so much gratitude, you know. Just all the food and also just having like access to all these amazing meats, you know. I'm like putting oxtail in our slow cooker and like along with the oxtail, I'll put some, you know, pork shoulder and I'm thinking, gosh, how darn grateful am I to have this? You know, how darn grateful are we to have that food? Yeah just there we don't have to like run after animals which i didn't feel good about right but you know we've we've put down our turkey and we know the process of at least a you know butchering a bird but it's a lot of work and i just i just want to say like be thankful for what you have every day write your gratitude because you know i wasn't there with you hunting but man after your stories i was like sheesh I get Makes it, man. Realize, put, puts things into perspective, you know? It really, really, really does. And even like maybe that's why travel is so important. And we're heading um, out soon to uh, go somewhere that's, you know, it might, it's going to be a lot different from Kirkland, Washington. Santiago, Chile, yeah. yeah it's going to be amazing. There's be a, a big, a burgeoning low carb community there. And yeah. we're giving a talk and um, mm-hmm. we're going to explore and travel. And, and there was a lot of political unrest. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Like a million people took the streets. It was a small hike in the subway, subway fair that caused uh, an uprising because there's a huge, like, the uh, inequality, the, the pay gap is very. Um, big, one of the biggest in the world there. Like mm-hmm. some ultra elite, very rich, and then just super poor. Yeah, which not we're going to see all of, right? It's, it's going to be just, crazy. So we yeah. decided not to bring our daughter. Um, mm-hmm. She's going to stay here with my mom, which hopefully my mom will. It, I, I think it's going to be good for my mom. Um, yeah. You know, because um, we don't have a furnace. Like a lot of people uh, like, like look at us. Um, we try to live this like for real like so there's a you know over Deanna's shoulder we have a wood stove and which is so, why I'm on this side <laughs> <laughs> women definitely are more susceptible to cold fluctuations and and so mm. it's been two and a half years it'll it be has. three years this winter and we still have work to do like we're, we're obviously not perfect with this we're still learning but it is it, it's just really neat to bring it all in the home you know, why well, should let me just r- r- pause a little bit. I, I don't want people to think like we can't afford to have a furnace. Our furnace broke in 2016 and um, we're going to remodel our house at some point or rent it out. And in which case we will have to buy a furnace. And I didn't know what size furnace to get. And the ductwork is, is really old. And there was this yucky carpet and we found mold in this home. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, well, we can't just get the furnace. We're going to have to redo all the ducking, you know, all the ductwork and you know, because carpet um, collects persistent organic pollutants and endocrine disrupting chemicals and, and mold and all this. I'm like, it's gonna be a major investment. Right. And it's like, if we're gonna remodel soon, it's like, I don't wanna do all that and then have to redo it again, right. you know? And so our city is getting, we're on septic, you know, cause we're kind of out in the country. Uh, well, it's getting more and more city-like. And, and so the sewer is coming, we don't know exactly when, and we can't remodel our home until we get off septic onto sewer. Right. Because we have a non-conforming unit, it's a smaller septic tank, and so they don't allow you to, we had to redo the septic tank in this way. I had all these, and I, I'm sure you don't even care about this, but for those of you listening, <laughs> Septic systems are pretty interesting in the sense that our soils don't perk, meaning they don't allow much water to get in. And I had this architect, uh, septic tank architect, which was like four grand, had to pay him cash to get him out here. He drew up these architectural plans and we had to tear out like every tree in our backyard. So all the Douglas fir trees that keep the house, you know, uh, you know, cool in the summer, we're going to have to get ripped out. The apple tree that we love, Mm -hmm. all my garden beds, we're going to have to get ripped out for the septic tank. I'm like, hell no, I'm not doing that. And so anyway, we're just banking on the fact that, that the sewer is coming because this neighborhood is undergoing like a, a gentrification and a huge development and all these old big lots are being split up into duplexes and there's a ton of construction. The down That's the downside. The upside is we'll get sewer and then in which case we can, you know, start expanding and doing all that. But until then... But what we've learned, you guys, is short showers, which is good anyway, right? Like we have very short showers they're not this warm, luxurious, like, ah, I feel so good. No, it's just to get the hair washed. And then um, the gym we belong to, we tend to 
do more of like the longer showers there if you actually have to shave your legs whatnot if you do that sort of thing um but yeah it's just we know how to be very minimalistic which i think is extremely important you know we share a, a bathroom um so the lifestyle that we live now is is uh it's a lot more like minimalistic than it used to be before you know we met yeah. uh for both of us i'm sure uh and it, it's kind of neat like it's a little bit it's it's liberating for sure you know it makes you realize again to be thankful for the little things that we have um and then when the power goes out which happens often with the wind the here winter. uh we have the furnace and i've learned how to we build, the a, wood stove. build a fire which i'm all proud about um if the power goes out it's no big deal because yeah. we are turning out the lights in that anyway we have yeah. headlamps we have flashlights like we're trying to minimize our light exposure and use these incandescent bulbs because of right. how they pulse and all that and so and cook on the wood stove and it's pretty cool it's like a little cabin. Uh, yeah. And, you know, if you were to throw us into this environment seven years ago, we'd be like, dude, this is kind of white trash. Like, like we'd on. be complaining. This sucks. This sucks. You know? like, dude, but what now it's like, okay, we got like, this. We love it. And then, yeah. you know what? I'm trying to, as a parent, like have a, a kid that's tough. Like I don't want a little weenie kid that like, and when we go hiking and I'm, I don't want to put down friends or family, but like when we go hiking with um, other families, and their children or we're outdoors with other other children they can barely walk without i mean that they're like cold or they're too hot or they need water or they're they hungry need, they're hungry and yeah. like we don't have any food or nothing like when we go hiking or outdoors with right. people or they bring snacks so that the halfway mark would during like a 20 minute hike they want food yeah and so it's just like I, I don't know I, I mean our daughter could have who knows if she'll be a tough cookie and does that even matter? Maybe I, it is important to me. Right. I want it. And I think it's important for parents to have children that can think for themselves mm -hmm. and uh, solve problems and, and have some resilience, you know, because for our kids, life is pretty damn easy. And to know what hunger is too. Like there's been moments where we have been, we've left the house quick to go on a long hike and, you know, our daughter, we're hiking up the mountain and she's like, gosh, I'm, kind like of hungry and, and she we don't hear that often from her because she's pretty intuitive with her hunger thank goodness but um so she knows what it feels like to be hungry just for a little bit it's not like we're going out of our way to make her feel that yeah, way but no gosh no but it's like she's felt it and then we're like okay 10 more minutes type of thing you know or 30 more minutes or an hour and um so she's getting to feel those uncomfortable feelings that are normal feelings you know so, it's good yeah. yeah and so we don't bring like this big giant and again we're in washington state like yeah. if we were in texas or if we we're in southern cal where, where dehydration could be you know fatal or right. a oh, health gosh, of problem and things like we'll that a little water bottle so we have something we're not like but it's just nice because then we can yeah. just on the cuff say hey let's go for a hike or let's go for a walk or let's go down to the beach yeah and we don't need to bring a backpack full of crap for right. food it's not like this all day like packing a backpack with first aid kit and right. band-aids and flares and you know <laughs> stuff like that like it you know and all this food like sugar pills just in case like right. we, we don't have to do that yeah and so the, the point is humans know how to survive and i think that's kind of the the point of this podcast is like we thrive with more minimal things that's what i realized and we thrive right. with a little struggle we thrive with a little strife mm -hmm. you know i'm gonna have i mean when i left um when i left i was crying seriously yeah huh wow. yeah because uh You're gonna make me cry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> God. Um, oh, jeez. It, it's just uh, it was just a great experience, you know. And um, yeah, I don't want to start crying right now, but no, you are it was just it was a great experience, and it was like, wow, you know, like we're tougher than we got it so damn easy. I was just like, this is like, like at at the time. And, you know, it sucked. And then uh, also uh, we were kind of living a tribal kind of life, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, getting wood together, making fires together, eating together, hiking together. And uh, <laughs> I'm like crying, dude. No, no, I'm not, <laughs> it's just like I'm not trying to be a voice, but it's like I was like, wow, like life here kind of is not like that. Yeah. Like we're we're isolated you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm. um we go to coffee shops on our computers and stuff like that like it's right. like and i was like wow i'm gonna miss that yeah you know? yeah 
Anyway, so point is like, get the hell outside, guys. Yeah, get outdoors. Get with your buddies. If you, if you don't have friends that are into this, like make new friends. Oh yeah. And uh, you know, in the struggle, you know, it's going to help you become a better person. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to have more resilience. You know, um, and, and struggling like with your with your relatives, with your your sibling, that's going to forge relationships. Like in seven days, I, I made you know these these connections with these guys. W- we're going to remember that forever. Mm-hmm. You know, like. You know, the, these crappy uh, camping on the top of a ridge at 9,000 feet in the snow when it's howling wind, like 40 mile an hour winds, you know, Brian and I, we're going to remember that forever, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, yeah. way more than if I go and, and look, I, I watch football games with siblings or friends and we're on the phone, we're kind of eating, we're kind of there, but we're not, you know what I mean? And like, we had to share those memories and uh, yeah, it's good. Sheesh. I need to get with the girls. Good, yeah. On so I just, trip. I, I just, yeah. I don't want to make a big stink about it. Um, I mean, look, there's people that are listening to this to so like they've backpacked up Everest. Maybe someone has done it some doesn't crazy just take stuff, that, though. I think you know. I mean, can we all do that? No. It's just, you know, you're actually encouraging me to to do more of that. You know, um, with guys or girls, it's just we get stuck in our groundhog days, which we have to. I mean, obviously, we all have jobs and we have to work and. But maybe just putting in the calendar, you know, to do these sorts of things. Like even if it's just a camping trip, it doesn't have to be like out hunting for animals, just something that is really going to change your life. And that's why I'm really excited about our trip because I don't often travel because I have that mommy feeling like I don't want to leave my daughter, blah, 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 you know, but um, gosh darn it. Like you have to get out and experience outside of your bubble to really help other people, to serve people. It's not just about like okay, I want this to like change me because of me, me, me. It's like, you know, how good am I to serve others if I'm kind of locked within my little shelter and I don't really know how others are feeling or I don't know about this or that. And that's why I'm so super excited about, you know, Chile because we're going to see, you know, people who aren't so as fortunate and it's going to really just ingrain that in me. So when I come back, I'll be like, gosh, darn it. Like, do I, do I need this? Do I truly need this? Does our daughter need this? What do we truly need in life and how can we help others? Yeah. You know, it's important. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I really appreciate you all tuning in, whether you're watching this on YouTube or listening in iTunes. Um, I'll put a link to the show notes, you know, so if you're listening on iTunes, you can just scroll up and I'll put links to things that we talked about, you know, the headlamp and, uh, the Redmond Real Salt and our show is sponsored Ned, go to helloned.com. Mm-hmm. And if you guys want to see more dehydration stuff, we like, do that, yeah, yeah well, you know, and I am going to gosh darn it, but, uh, with like the organ meats and all that good stuff, you guys, you can follow us on Instagram cause we typically show like what we eat and how to do these things on our Instagram handles, which Mike will have on his show notes too. For sure. So, uh, yeah. And if you enjoyed this content, uh, we'd be honored if you could leave us some feedback in iTunes or yeah. wherever you listen to this on Stitcher. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can hit that like button. Definitely subscribe. Um, and, and uh, you know, you haven't been on the YouTube or podcast for a little while. It's been about a month or so or more. Yeah. Um, so uh, a lot of people wanted you back. So I'm glad that you're back. Yeah. It's not like that you went away. It's just that, you know, like, we are doing yeah. different things. And, yeah. and, and, and you know, some people... Um, can be rude on YouTube and you <laughs> took it personally. And I'm just kind of like a, a social introvert, you guys. So like normally, like this whole YouTube thing was just so new for me and I've I've gotten used to it, but I, I got over it. Like at first, Mike, when I, when I was introduced to like trolls, I guess, um, I was really sensitive to it, but to me that's kind of selfish because if I stay away from that, and this is just like a life learning lesson, I can't help others. And YouTube is one of the best ways, especially through your channel, for me to help others. And so um, I'm back on, gosh darn it. And and I realized, you know, people who are hating, and this is because it happens a lot, are just, they're hating because they have something going on deep down inside themselves, an insecurity, or they're unhappy, and they feel like they have to do that. And, you know, it also teaches just us in general, like if you ever have something kind of negative to say about something. It says more about. Think about yourself. Per- like, yeah, just. There was a, there's an aphorism. Um, what Sally says about Sam is more of reflection about Sally. I agree with thing. that. Yeah. Because like yeah. How, how someone speaks about someone else is a really good window into their own personality and realizing that, wow, that person, you know, 
Be- because think about the most positive people that you know. Mm-hmm. You know, when they talk about other people, like, oh, I, I love him. He was just, like amazing. Right. And then some of the negative people are like, ooh, uh, they're this way or they're that way and right. all that. And it's like, that speaks volumes about them. And guess what? You know, we all want to be around, most of us, positive people that uplift us, right? So, you know, I truly hate being around people that are negative because it just makes me feel crummy. It really does. So, you know, and it also makes me realize when I'm wanting to be negative, because it's human, right? Like we all tend to be that way sometimes, whether it be the weather or whatnot. It's it's your mindset. And, you know, basically it's like, just be positive if, if you can, be grateful. And most people, it'll attract more positivity in your life. And I, I find that myself like, I, I see that. I witness that every day. Even just like not like road raging or in the grocery store, like being calm and smiling at people. People will smile back, you know, and it's just a nice, it's a better way to live. Yeah. <laughs> just happy. <laughs> Happiness is good. It is. No, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's funny. It's like um, the people are, people are yearning or, or looking for, you know, th- this interaction. Mm-hmm. We're tribal people. Yeah. You know, and so the the person that has kind of the scowl on their face, or whatever, sometimes they're just like so shy. Yeah, that scowl is actually, uh, you know, kind of masking fear, you know, or something right. along those lines. And then when you smile, they're like, "Oh, oh, it's safe. Like it feels safe." Like, right. Um, so yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, super grateful that you're all here. Appreciate tuning all the way in. Um, definitely connect with Deanna over on Instagram. It's at dr dr Deanna Muscle, right? <laughs> No, I, I was I was trying to think because your email is dr dot right. I have a, yeah a lot of going on. So anyway, dr it's all there's no dots or anything. We'll dr have it in the show notes. dr Daniel Russell yeah. and then metabolic underscore Mike on Instagram or on Facebook as well. Yep. Um, as always, friends, super grateful that you tuned in all the way. Hope you enjoyed it. Show notes will be linked below and yeah. get the heck outside. Go outside, you guys. All right, catch you on the next episode. Bye bye.